are we still allowed to talk until five minutes before or or maintain silence now for the next 15 minutes?
and welcome to EMDRCM Live. This is episode 8, I think. We've lost track. But welcome back to this particular outreach activity of the Executive Master in Disaster Risk and Crisis Management from the country's premier graduate school for business and management. My name is Wally Pakaniban. I hope you're keeping well and safe and healthy in your respective homes. Today, we are very excited to talk to you about a very interesting initiative that's uh, developed by this brilliant team that's joining us today. So uh, to usher in our discussion into the Agile Collaboration in Action topic for today, I would like to ask this brilliant team to introduce themselves one by one, starting with my fellow classmate from EMDRCM, Jason. Uh, Jason, I think you are on mute. Can you unmute your, you're there? Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Jason Bunaga. I am one of the candidates for the pioneer batch of the Executive Masters Disaster Risk Crisis Management for the Asian Institute of Management. Um, my background is in international disaster response. I've worked in uh, multiple continents. And at the same time, uh, I also work here in the Philippines for a disaster response organization to connect um, the Team Rubicon into what they're trying to do here in the Philippines. Thank you. Maybe the gentleman behind you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm Jeff. Good afternoon. Um, I belong to the uh, Master in Development Management 2020 cohort. Um, I am currently the country security and resiliency manager for a multinational company that has um, BPO operations and corporate offices here in the Philippines. So, yeah, I think uh, my experience as a uh, security manager really helped me a lot in developing the, the processes here in the situation room and at the same time organizing my, my fellow colleagues and uh, teammates here. 
We also have with us uh, Poonam. Um, hi, uh, this is Poonam Shabra. I am an MBA graduate, uh, 2020 graduating student. Um, I am a professional software engineer and uh, I have a myriad of experience with startups to the major tech corporates. Uh, in AIAM Citroom, I had been working with the IT team uh, to provide the information uh, from the from the different news channels and social media and providing doing the vetting of the information that's coming from the right source and then handing it over to the team to take it over. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next on the list we have Nikki. Hi, I'm Nikki Abora. Um, I'm the information team lead in the AAM Situation Room. So I am an MBA graduate. I graduated last year and my background is in computer science as well. And I've also been writing some scripts to help automate some tasks for the AAM Situation Room. I've also written a few um, situation reports and policy briefs with regards to technology and data analytics. Okay, thank you. Finally, we have, oh, sorry, we have Jishu. Jishu stepped, uh, Jishu stepped out, but uh, Jishu, is, uh, his expertise is in uh, MSDS. He comes from the 2020 cohort. Data and, science. Okay, and uh, we'll, we'll hear from Jishu later on. We also have Jomar in the room. Hi, I'm Jomar. I'm uh, also a part of the MDM 2020 cohort. I'm, my background is in fundraising. I used to work for a performing arts NGO. So that's the industry I represent. Okay, thanks Jomar. So later on, we'll also be joined by Carlo who will explain his background to us. So if you just listen carefully to the way, to the background of the the team that just uh, introduced themselves, they're quite diverse in terms of their expertise, which makes this particular initiative, which is officially called the AIM Skunk Works Initiative Situation Room, quite a mouthful. But uh, if, uh, for short, you can just call it the AIM Sit Room, or for this discussion, we'll just refer to it as the Sit Room. So uh, guys, anybody can just uh, answer and contribute to the discussion. Uh, tell us first what the sit room is all about. Uh, basically, the situation room was born from uh, uh, from the Taal operations uh, up when we had when we had the Taal operations. It was originally intended by the TMDR students to collaborate um, the different diverse backgrounds from LGU to NGO and all the way to the CSO and private sector who are part of the makeup of that class to collaborate and uh, find a way to do the seamless interaction and seamless uh, um, efforts uh, that were being done by organizations that was within our classes when it comes to the donations and the tracking of the situation report. Uh, from then, uh, we were able to make some headway with the uh, with the national government, specifically with the OCD. We were given information and other data that was not uh, privy to different organizations at the time, but uh, were given to us in an academic uh, standpoint for us to be able to look at it as students and candidates of this uh, of the EMDRCM program. And from then on, uh, when the COVID nineteen happened, uh, Jeff behind me. Um, He'll, uh, he'll talk right after me on how the Situation Room, originally as an operation center, came to be uh, under the direction of Prof. Ken uh, because we wanted to uh, do the continuation in some shape or form of what was uh, done back in uh, January for our Taal operations. So from there, I was also stuck in Makati. So when uh, all the dormers uh -huh. that were part of this uh, uh, came together and uh, Jeff was one of the one that uh, really, um, you know, got uh, a lot of the students that were stuck here and I, I came in about like a couple of days later to really uh, put together the process flow and uh, stuff like that uh, as, uh, as Jeff originally uh, also put together the process flow chart on how the situation came to be. So basically, um, the hope the, for uh, my end, uh, when I was talking to Prof. Ken, Prof. Ken wanted to 
uh, to enhance what the operation center was about and uh, mm -hmm. we wanted to pursue our open collaboration uh, with the different programs of AIM to come up with solutions and also become the devil's advocate in terms of what the national government uh, was coming up with with their references and reports and uh, okay. I'll turn it over to Jeff to give right. his uh, part on how he started the uh, situation room in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, uh, I agree with Jason. Um, we 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 were here like me. I'm a dormer, and uh, um, when Prof Ken uh, visited us, so we talked about it, and we agreed that we should make our time here uh, valuable and at least um, spend it in a way that we could contribute to the problems of the country and our respective communities in, in different countries that uh, because we have foreign students here. So all of us agreed that maybe we should uh, make our time here uh, valuable and, and yeah, right. contribute. So, so with to that, clarify, Jeff, to clarify yeah. Jason, Jeff, Everybody in the team that's with us today are uh, we're all part of the, the the team that created the sit room, and all of you were quarantined at the dorm. Yes. Yeah. Um, not quite. Uh, I'm not at the dorm. I'm mm -hmm. all the way at home in Paranaque, Puna Menai. I think are living in our respective homes. Um, so because I'm already a graduate, um, I believe it was somewhere at around the end of March where Jason uh, messaged me saying that, um, hey, this is the sit room. And then I found out that I could help and that's how I came in. So not quite all of us were stuck at the dorm. Okay. Uh, some of us just wanted to volunteer. Right, Good. okay. So some people were from the dorm stuck and have all the free time in the world to contribute, but we also have you guys who, well, I'm also guessing quarantined in your respective places, right? Right, and so we get a, a more diverse group. So those people also, not just from the current batch of students, also from um, previous students like you, Nikki. Okay, Jeff, so you were saying, can you continue the what you were saying yeah. earlier? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, when we talked about uh, forming the, the group, or we, we, we used to call it Operation Center before, but then we realized that it would be more applicable to call it a situation group as we go along. So um, I was able to talk to my fellow MDM students and some of the MBA students and MSDS students. So we all volunteered and somehow um, agreed to, to contribute our different uh, disciplines to, to create a valuable output based from um, what we hear or what we get from social media, from references or um, um, books and whatever um, validated the report. So from there, we organized the, the process flow so that we could process or facilitate the, the proper um, documentation of the information that, that we got. But then we know, we know, all of us, we know that fake news was really bad during that time. So that is one of the very important things that we immediately uh, look after. So we created the, the process flow in a way that we would um, gather information from both the reactive side, which is headed by Jomar here, and then the proactive side, which is basically uh, working on research on validated documents so that this information would be uh, used by me and Jason, which is on the core group, as well as one of our colleagues from MBA, uh, Tony. So we are the, the processors of these um, information inputs. And we also put in some case inputs from our advisors, like Prof Ken and our senior management here at AIM. And we lia liaised with intelligence community who also feeds um, information that helps validate our, our research and um, triage of information. And then we have on the output side, Carlos is not here. He heads the publication and communication. So, but, but before public, publication and communication, Tony, who is from the MBA, he heads the secretariat team who curates all this information and organize all our activities. So 
that's the whole process flow that we, we were able to, to come up with. So uh, how long did it took uh, the, uh, the team to put all of this together? I think it was just one week, around one week. No? One week. Uh, our, one of the, I think the biggest hurdle when we show it later is uh, coming up with monitors because we needed uh, certain resources. But because the school was on lockdown, it took uh, the staff that were available to actually turn some of those over to us uh, were not allowed to come in into the uh, uh, campus yet. And uh, we've been fortunate enough that, you know, um, we were able to use uh, the case from here, uh, which was donated by Meralco for the renovations that it has gone so far. And uh, what we were trying to prove also with the Situation Room was to turn it into a proof of concept that can be turned over to the next uh, year's batch because uh, we do know that you know, disasters are not going to sleep, disasters are not going to stop. And like here in the Situation Room, we're already exploring the idea of the, uh, the black swan, white rhino situation when we still have a COVID pandemic. And at the same time, we're dealing with the natural hazards and calamities that's about to hit the country within the next six to eight months that uh, happens in a cycle right. uh, here in the country. So we're looking into that now. Um, but basically, we've been around here. Uh, we've been online since uh, I think March 25 until now. So it's been about 60 days already. So that's where we're at. So we've been around since ECQ was lifted, relifted, rebranded, branded, and then uh, shoved down uh, everyone. What, what was the dynamics between the team like? You come from different backgrounds, different personalities, probably also different environments. Was it difficult? pulling all the brilliance together where there are heated arguments and how to move forward? Um, very the heated, forward. Yeah, the heated <laughs> arguments, I think, are actually part of the system mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. um, <laughs> as mentioned by uh, Jeff and Jason, that we try to play devil's advocates. Um, it's kind of difficult when everybody is a devil's advocate, but it's really part of the system because we need to make sure that the information that we are crunching and sending out are uh, vetted. We are not bring, we're not turning out fake news and all that. So it, it happens, arguments happen, but I think because of our training in MBA, we know how to have these kinds of discussions. Right. Not just MBA, sorry. Um, the entire AIM actually. Uh, this this kind of thing is supposed to be trained in us. Uh, Punam is agreeing with me because MBA, <laughs> this is really trained uh, in sorry, our sorry. program. So yeah. Um, sorry. Was what was the rest of your question? Well, I, that was going to say uh, the process that that went into this had to also involve a lot of. Um, uh, research on the individual from the individual capacity and bring all of them together. Who orchestrates uh, the entire process? How did we do that, Jason? <laughs> oh, that was uh, so. Tony, uh, Tony is our resident guru when it comes to process flowcharts. Uh, her background was in, I think, uh, industrial design. So when uh, when Jeff was uh, when Jeff had it in a causal loop diagram, somebody had to turn it into a process. <laughs> Low chart and then uh, <laughs> so that's where Tony came in that she would ask us so this is what we're gonna do at the very first beginning this is gonna be and this is why uh, we were able to come up with the skiff uh, process you know the compartmentalized in, uh, sensitive compartmentalized information flow process because we were getting uh, sensitive information that we shouldn't uh, that we couldn't talk about uh, to outside the situation room uh, one of the things that we perform the Situation Room is what they call in the academic community called Chatham House Rules. Uh, it basically means that whatever is talked about within your circle stays within the circle. Uh, no names, no, uh, no evidence. Uh, it's definitely a, re a great way to really play that whole devil's advocate and at the same time uh, really come up with viable information. One of the things that we've done pretty well uh, here at the Situation Room at the very beginning, uh, we were able to identify the three uh, key things that we're dealing with now, which were uh, food security, financial security, and physical security. Uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff uh, heavily talked about in his first report about the importance of uh, not necessarily just the discipline, but really the collaboration part when it came to the 
physical security aspect and lo and lo and lo and uh, you know, behold and uh, many of our predictive analysis based on what we were doing with uh, web scraping sent uh, some basic sentimental analysis we were also delving into machine learning we wow. were able to come up with a lot of these um, um, predictions that were actually based in real life scenario and um, I think uh, that's what made the situation room different from what Ateneo was doing, from what Lasal was doing, or even what uh, UP was doing. Uh, UP was trying to crunch uh, data that happened already and come up with that analysis versus what we were doing is what's going on right now and how can we predict the pattern that's coming out, not only from the national government, but also the individual themselves. And then right. uh, try to, um, to predict the outcomes of that. And, um, you know, there were, uh, we had a couple of reports already, like the, about the national ID, about the OFWs, about the creative arts. Um, it, it, it started rolling downhill and we started seeing that all, a lot of the things that we were talking about in the situation room started happening. It's not because of the national government was not able to do it, but it's because it really was because we were in an unprecedented time and there were just a lot of moving parts and everybody was just concentrated on one key aspect of the pandemic, which was the response and uh, consequence management of the event, where we were, what we were looking into was, we were looking into going out from uh, from the M, uh, from the ECQ to uh, GCQ to the new normal. Uh, right. The situation room uh, really did come up with some of those that happened to be used by Carbon. Uh, no, uh, the Cavite province. They started. Right. Uh, they yeah. So when you, if, if you're going to explain it uh, in the simplest way, what is the output of this uh, situation room? Uh, based on us as a uh, as an EMDR CM student, uh, the perspective that I could say, uh, and you were gonna hear from the other uh, students from the program for the DRCM lens, it, what it provides for us in the simplest form is. The ability for you to come up with better informed decision that's not only backed by data, but at the same time backed by uh, by uh, different stakeholders and right. different uh, collaborators that to come up with the right solution. So do you generate a report? Yes, we do. Every day? No, uh, that's what makes us different because uh, we because everybody else is doing situation reports and policy right. briefs. What we do is we concentrate in one particular crisis and uh, we look on what that crisis will entail. Like uh, now what we're looking into is what happens with the new normal? How are we going to solve the problem of two things, which is the health sector capacity building when it comes with the other uh, vaccination programs or other uh, diseases that have come out. It. In so it's, it's quite different from the, the, the things that we've seen initially when the pandemic broke out. Most uh, groups started uh, monitoring the figures, the statistics, right? Yes. It became uh, the race for the best uh, visualization of the data. But for the situation room at the IIM, it's all about the analysis. Yes. Is that and, accurate? Uh, Nikki, yeah, Nikki can even bring up some of those points. Uh, Nikki came up with, uh, with the national ID uh, scenario where it eventually led us to this situation now. Uh, Nikki, can you talk so, more about that? <laughs> well, actually, just besides the national ID issue, um, because this whole pandemic, it's really it really exposed a lot of the inherent issues in our in our system, um, the entire government system down to the LGU down to um, SMEs or MSMEs. So, with that, um, yes, each um, and there are entities that try to fix problems from each level. However, because of um, I think. I'm not entirely sure, but it feels like they're very concentrated on in their own systems that they forget the rest. So what no, we no, do sure. is, yes. So what we do is we try to come up with a more holistic solution. Um, for example, uh, if 
I, I don't actually know which, who I'm allowed to mention here. Okay, but so that guy, whatever, or that LGU. That, yeah, that particular <laughs> LGU, we only give solutions for, for example, the mayor of that LGU. But then we would also have solutions for, say, the disaster risk team of that LGU, okay. or maybe even um, a business in that LGU. Um, so far, I think. Um, for example, the BPO industry is going to be um, incredibly hard hit. They are hard right. hit, uh, especially in terms of their cybersecurity. Once we lift ECQ, how are they going to do social distancing in the office? Because we know BPOs are really cramped. So how do we come up with solutions for all of these? So, okay, so it's the combination of the analysis and the recommendation. Yes, so okay. that's another thing that uh, separates us. Our recommendations are supposed to be actionable items, things that, right. okay, this is the step-by-step -step guide of what you're supposed to do. So if I were to be the recipient of that particular report, I, I would have an easier time processing my ideas and thoughts because already uh, the analysis has been provided for by the brilliant minds behind the sit room together with concrete actionable items. Now, As question. Okay, this is customized to a particular location or industry or client, no? Yes, we try to customize okay. it. We have a general, um, we have a template, and then we try to customize it based on uh, your respective LGU or your respective business. This is my question Let's when I was again. talking yeah. to Jason initially. The report is not given out to the rest of the world. It's, it's really targeted uh, recipients. Yes. Okay, got it. Yes. I'd like, like to know what um, we're yeah. going to bring out now uh, about the creative arts. I'd like to, uh, because uh, I'd like to, for Jomar to talk more about that. With his background, he was able to see and what the Situation Room does. We were able to see uh, through the lens of what's going on with the creative arts now, which is another really hard hit industry. Uh, Jomar, if you can uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, yes. Uh, since I used to work for the creative arts industry, specifically the performing arts industry, uh, right now uh, it's it's estimated that it will start only to recover by the January next year, uh, since we all the live industries also depend on the schools, which is also closed and everything else. So the creative arts industry is not only the performing arts industry. It's also multiple disciplines. That includes even architecture, construction work. So that includes under construction work, manufacturing. So it's a whole, it intersects a lot of industries, including tourism right. and um, even IT. It's a wide ecosystem. It's right? a wide, it's a wide, wide ecosystem. Uh, arts industry. Yes. So what, so the main problem is, is that the government doesn't even have a, a cohesive program to develop these industries because they don't even have a, a baseline for it because of the multiple layers. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been already in talks to create one, but the problem is, is that dif the different uh, agencies from these different uh, departments and different uh, industries that oversees the overseas manufacturing, or for example, DTI, for the, or DOT, and even PSA, have different ways of gathering data and reviewing them. So in a way, they they create their own database that doesn't merge well together. So when uh, so when the pandemic struck, it only aggravated the need for one, for one whole cohesive database. And so that's why a lot of these uh, workers in the creative industries, that this includes the, uh, what do you call it, weavers, the craftsmen, all the way up in, in the provinces, in, not only in here in, the Met, in Metro Manila, like uh, gaffers, uh, lights crews, theater crews, most of them are day wage earners, and some of them don't even are not even, uh, and are not even part of any lists, because they are really informal. So what do we do? So 
from uh, from the other organization that I'm with, uh, who's in charge of uh, disseminating education education about welfare, artist welfare, and um, other benefits that they should know about their craft. Uh, created uh, is also spearheading in creating this uh, nationwide database. So not only because it, they want to um, advance their uh, agenda, but also it really helps because they are the ones, since uh, their mandate is uh, for the uh, artist welfare, all artists, whether you're a well-known artist or even just a, a worker, you're part of that industry. And that's why they have the trust of the workers. And the problem with uh, the creative industries, with so many disciplines, within each discipline, there's so many other uh, organizations. You have fil for film, you have so many. We have okay. For actors, you have so many. For theater, there's so many other companies there. So within, even within the, these subgroups, there's also different dynamics. Oh, oh, how much more uh, bringing them all together? Okay. The good thing about the Jomar, Jomar, when, uh, yes. just to clarify, so when when you talk about the creative arts industry and the particular role that the Situation Room played into this, um, correct me if I'm wrong. You were able to somehow um, identify the gaps and consolidate data that somehow represented this particular industry that the government apparently has not really looked into? Uh, somehow, well, we were able to get uh, data from different industries, from different sectors that coincides with the creative arts industries. And we are able to collate it and be able, and now we're able to uh, form our own or propose our own policy suggestions. Okay. So I think at the end of the day, these are uh, interesting milestones because you're absolutely right. Um, some people are more focused with the people that are displaced from factories, but there are a lot in the informal sector that are not on any list, like you mentioned. Um, I'd like to uh, also hear from Poonam, because I think one of the contributions you, you have for this particular initiative was about the, the information structure. Is that right? Was it difficult because of the overwhelming amount of information out there? Suddenly, with the pandemic, everybody's an expert. So how did you sift through the, the heaps <laughs> of information that was um, everywhere? I think, uh, first of all, I will uh, appreciate the whole team for that. It's not a one-person effort. It's the whole team who was vetting the information. Uh, we had some guidelines when we were actually scraping the websites, uh, the news channels and the social media. So we tried to limit ourselves to particular keywords and particular uh, uh, well-known news channels only, not, not going randomly anywhere to find out the information. Um, for me, uh, the AIM sit room was, is just like you mentioned, it's like bridging the gap. So it started by bridging the gap of, uh, of providing the basic needs. So initially we were trying to find the information uh, of who, who are really need, needing the, need the resources, like who are lacking the resources and who are the resourceful people. For example, some food industries were trying to help, but then they did not know where to go. And similarly, the government wanted to help the needies, but they did not know where exactly to send their helps. So uh, the whole situation room started with providing their basic needs and basic uh, basic information and bridging the gap. And it's still continuing to bridge the gap by providing the right analysis, right reports uh, to, to help these communities and businesses come back to normal. So it's all about, um, know the right resources where right websites where to go right news channels where to go and then finding it based on the particular uh keywords or you know vetting the information based on that and then putting it forward in the chain right and i think at the end of the day the way that you have processed the information really helps define the strategies and policy recommendations you put forward now what are the biggest challenges that you encountered in setting this all this, this, this situation room? 
Um, I think uh, the biggest challenge is this. Uh, we have different lenses and different mindsets as uh, with our respective programs. Uh, for us, with our sister program, the Master in Development uh, Management, uh, we tend to work more in trying to solve the social inequities and social inequalities of, uh, of the country. Whereas, you know, you have a very specific uh, program and very specific mandate for like the MBA, the MMSDS, they have a different lens on the way they look at it. But one thing is for sure, the cross collaboration, you know, uh, you know, taking ownership uh, and then presenting it and trying to have co-ownership of the problem. And then you bring all the programs together and you co-create, you know, the solutions. And I think that's really where we excelled here uh, as the situation room, because in itself, we were able to practice what we really learned in the program, uh, not only with our respective program, but what we were taught in terms of bridging leadership, uh, leadership capital, uh, strategic negotiations, uh, sensing the other party when it comes to their empathy and things like that. And, and I'd like to point out, it really what separates the institutions, or at least specifically the executive master in disaster risk crisis management, from all the other ones out there. Because when you look at it, um, the the way that the EMDRCM taught us was to look at it in a holistic approach, and uh, not necessarily get bogged out in the technical details, but really get uh, more um, more solutions at hand with the proper analysis using data analytics, using, uh, you know, uh, uh, known methods and taking best practices or best known methods from uh, other institution and really applying it in this uh, volatile, uncertain, and of course, complex, ambiguous world that we live in, right. the VUCA world. That's something that I think that we're proud of when it comes to our respective programs, you know, not just the EMDRCM and why. Uh, the institution itself is leading the way when it comes to uh, right. to our respective programs here. And I think one of the, the great things that you guys have shown the rest of the AIM community and the world is that if you harness the collective power of the individual, the individual and the groups and the departments that they belong to, you can really move mountains. Now, what is the big plan? What is the ambitious um, end state for the Situation Room? Um, I think, uh, Jeff, you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, this is still under discussion. Um, we, we haven't really finalized what what would be with uh, for us in the future. But but me personally, um, I, 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 I see this as a, a regular or a, a regular group or a regular maybe we can call it an institution later on that that mm -hmm. handles information and process them so that we could provide. Like what Nikki said a while ago, uh, actionable, uh, I, as actionable uh, recommendations, right? So for now, we, we, we are just starting this, but eventually um, I see the group to be handling not just pandemic, of course, but we, we might be also uh, handling different types of disasters, right. maybe storms, earthquakes, and also, um, going back to what you were asking a while ago about the, the product that we have, I think the, the collection of data and information that we have now is in itself a, a good output or a good product for, for the situation room, which would later on be used by, by AIM itself or maybe by other institutions who, who might need this data later on. And these are not just data, but these are process data, verified data and data that we curated into um, specific sectors like, like Jomar. Uh, we have curated some information and data for Jomar sector, for Carlos sector, for OFW, for Harold sector, for the agricultural sector, and for my sector, which is the, the BPO at the corporate side. So I think on, on the bigger or on the, uh, on the, in the future, I think, I, I feel that this would be this would have a very good potential to to help uh, multi-sectoral projects, uh, different institutions on whatever a crisis or a incident management requirement they would have. Yeah. Right. So and for all of you guys watching, if you are liking what you're hearing and seeing from our brilliant teams, they can definitely reach out to you guys, right? 
So any LGU out there, any private sector groups, any industry that might have um, some need that the Situation Room can provide, they're welcome to reach out to you guys, correct? Yeah, yes. so right now, um, admittedly, because everybody is um, having problems at the same time, um, just to set expectations, we might not be able to give you the same um, detailed reports that we gave our previous um, partners. So right now, but however, we might still be available for consultations and for very specific reports that you might need in order to make a decision. Right. And there might be potential funders out there who share the passion that you guys share, who might be just willing to really set up the institution of the situation room, make it a bigger skunk. Now, going back to that term, why is it called the Skunk Works Initiative? Ah, so back in uh, back in the late 50s, uh, Lockheed Martin had a division to design uh, a very, uh, they designed a they had a division that designed their secretive airplanes and crafts that they used for the United States military, and it was a skunk. Well, mm -hmm. the skunk uh, really came from a cartoon, but uh, <laughs> it's also in the business world, when you talk about skunk works, it really means, uh, because of what we do in the situation room, we have that, dev that the tent man principle or the devil's advocate principle here. Uh, we, are, we are a student-led, uh, you know, uh, open laboratory. Hence, uh, we we were given certain uh, uh, academic freedom to entertain all uh, all information, regardless if it's fake or not, and we really okay. delve into creating actionable recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, the Situation Room is not an organization or an open laboratory that criticizes, but rather it shows that what can we do better to take ownership from being a me to we. That's what right. we really do here at the Situation Room. We're not sending out data that says that you did this wrong, you did this wrong, and you don't. we're not here to break down other institutions or the government. What we have been doing since the very beginning is to look at it in a whole of us nation approach to find solutions for problems that the government may not be looking into because we recognize that the government is concentrating in certain priorities to ensure that the country really is uh, moving forward to where it needs to go, uh, right. regardless when of I, political affiliations. Yeah. When I first uh, saw the logo and the uh, reference to the skunk, I was, well, uh, the first reaction, cool, wow. And I did not uh, think that the management would allow such very uh, uh, youthful, uh, I don't know, execution of the brand or the logo. but. Wow, and it, 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 to me, it opened up a lot of possibilities because we can really come up with a solution that gets everybody to share in, in, in building the coalition moving forward. Now, I'd like to ask everybody, uh, what was the big, uh, across the, the people in this uh, uh, stream, what was the biggest learning for you uh, individually going through the process of contributing to the Situation Room? Let's start with Jomar. Well, uh, what my biggest learning for this is that uh, uh, if you really care, you just need to give time for this. And and seeing all uh, all the people around suffering, and then you just have to do something, even though you're still uh, you're here or trapped uh, in a in a dorm. There's there's a lot a lot of things that you can do to help. So it doesn't limit you to give a, to lend a hand. And uh, for me, I'd like to, uh, Carlo is uh, here. I'd like for him to share his thoughts on that. I'd like to give him uh, uh, some thoughts about that because when he wrote the report for the OFW, uh, it really resonated with a lot of us with here at the situation of the plight of our OFW. And really, that's one of, another good takeaway that uh, we can say that came out from the situation room, uh, the plight of the OFWs. Uh, thank you, Carlo. Hi. Um, yeah, just uh, wanted to share like uh, what uh, Sir Wally asked, you know, what a big uh, learning from this uh, experience is that uh, 
uh, for me, I had a deeper sense of uh, coordination and uh, collaboration with the others because uh, just like this morning, uh, in the I was reading the newspaper and one of the headlines is that uh, no, 42,000 or I think 47,000 OFWs are coming home and uh, I think we're not yet ready. And then I'm going through all the pages. I see that um, everything is interconnected. You know, even if it's just the OFW sector, it has a lot to do with health. It has a lot to do with the economy. So we cannot really just focus on one sector. We really need to have like a like a bird's eye view uh, in terms of looking into these uh, challenges that we have. And uh, finally, I'd like to add that uh, aside from looking at these as challenges, we can also look at these as opportunities on how we can uh, serve not just the sector we are directly involved in, but um, um, yeah, like what I mentioned, those that are directly or indirectly uh, uh, involved with the, the sector, like uh, education, health, yeah, so uh, yeah, those are my uh, key learnings from uh, uh, joining the sit room, the skunk sit room team. Carlo, what was your contribution to the situation room? What, uh, what particular aspect were you involved? Uh, together with uh, Tony and Chris, uh, with the guidance of uh, Prof. Ken and Sir Paul, of course, with uh, Jeff and Jason, we were able to come up with a policy recommendation for the repatriation okay. of the OFWs. Okay. So uh, we also like to add that the AIM Sitrum has given its reports to uh, the IATF uh, to General Galvez's office to a couple of representatives. And also uh, we have sent out uh, our version of what we see as what's going on to the office of the vice president also uh, and, um, and other uh, private sector. Uh, like what Nikki has uh, stated earlier, uh, a lot of our reports are tailored fit, not because we we only want to see, we only want them to see a certain perspective, but rather, uh, as they say in our data visualization and storytelling class for EMDRCM, uh, we are given an opportunity to make sure that what the message that you'd like to get across is understood and uh, seen uh, properly and uh, coordinated the right way is uh, how we really want to say it in, in that aspect. Uh, so, Jason, for you, you guys ever take class? For you, what was the biggest learning? The biggest learning for me is that uh, we talk about collaboration. We talk about, uh, you know, people always talk about collaboration. We always talk about doing what you can for the country. You all, we always talk about, you know, what have I contributed to the country? I, I think it really stems, it, the biggest learning for me, the key takeaway for me is this, that because of the pandemic and the ECQ that has befallen the country, any amount of uh, volunteerism, any amount of help to, uh, to really find out how we can go to the new normal is greatly needed today. You know, uh, it's not a question of, can I do it? It's really more of, I should do it because it's badly needed. And also at the same time, it really talks about where AIM uh, really sits in when it comes to developing the new business leaders and really the DRCM leaders of tomorrow, not just from the developmental management, from MDM leaders, MBA leaders, DRCM leaders, or even the data science leaders. It really talks about you know uh, the core uh, belief of AIM of cross-program collaboration and collaborative effort from, uh, you know, really going from, as uh, Prof. Nieves talks about in bridging leadership, uh, taking ownership and then um, doing co-ownership and co-creation of the space to go from we to uh, we collaboration. Okay. Um, Unam, biggest learning? Um, yeah, actually, I would, I would answer what's my biggest gain. Um, okay. So my is um, having a New bunch friends. of yes <laughs> the, uh, the the diversity of thoughts the diversity of perspectives that I have from different courses um, uh, obviously uh, it's it's similar to what Jason and Carlo mentioned about uh, collaborating and having a sense of ownership 
So the sense of ownership, the willingness to do, the uh, and the eagerness to you know be be on the top of uh, what is going on and still prioritizing each of your tasks accordingly because each of us have our own routine develop, develop, deliverables and our own stuff to do but we are still prioritizing these things over others so it's it's the biggest learning for me and the gain that i got from this thank you so for me my biggest learning is actually how much how much we don't know about what's going on like before joining into the situation room i was just absorbing all of the news passively and uh, admittedly i was one of those people that thought that i was the expert and I would blast all of my thoughts on social media. And when I joined the Situation Room, I just realized how much, you know, leading the information team in the Situation Room made me realize how much information I've actually been missing, how much we don't know about the situation. So with that, it's, it's actually quite humbling um, when you think that you're the expert and then you realize, oh, wait, I missed a whole lot of things. And there are actual experts out there that I, I'm very grateful for, very thankful for, especially when I ask them questions, they reply. Um, they're very eager also to help out in any way that they can. And so I'm grateful for them. Yeah. 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 For me, um, I, 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 I come to realize that everything that exists in, in this world is, is good. It's up to us to make it great or turn it otherwise. So yeah, with that, uh, I can relate to that because when, when we were stuck here, not just in the situation room, but here in, in, in the dorm, um, I had two options to make my time valuable and make what is, what is good to be great or, or to make it great. So I think I chose that because uh, I joined the situation room. And then the other option is just to uh, get depressed or join in a bash competition, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so I, <laughs> yeah, so obviously I didn't choose that. So that's it. It is also the same as what is happening now in in our in the world, like natural disasters. They are they are part of nature. So it is just us who chose to be on the way of these disasters. That's why disasters happen. And just like the virus, right? It's it's there. It has a role in in the in 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 the world in in nature, right? right. But then, um, whether it is artificial, or whether it is man-made, or whether it is not <laughs> really occurring, um, it is us who made it worse, right? So because of our uh, activities and uh, maybe uh, yeah, uh, because of human activities that right. we were at control. Yeah. And to reference what Nikki mentioned earlier, this pandemic is showing us the areas where we need to really beef up and improve. I have a weird question. And again, this is for the sake of discussion. Uh, don't hate me for this question. How do you know that you're actually making an impact? So, um, <laughs> Nikki found this one. So uh, it was... Uh, Nikki found this. There's two, I could say, the LG that we're working with now and uh, and watching the IATF come up with their guidelines and it mirrors some of the stuff that we came up with. But, you know, like, Nikki, go ahead. Yeah, so what Jason said, that um, the most um, concrete way that we know that we're making an impact is when the people are recipients of our... Um, uh, advices or suggestions actually give us feedback, immediate feedback. But another way is when we suddenly find that people are implementing our suggestions. Oh. Um, they, didn't, they don't have to come back to us for that. We see it in the news and then we, we hear that, oh wait, that we, we sent them that, right? So that's how we know that we're actually making an impact. Great. And uh, I'm pretty sure there will be a lot more of those things happening without you knowing that they're actually implementing what you're uh, training out. So, and then this question is also difficult. Was there anything you did wrong? Was everything smooth sailing in the process, so, in the development? 
admittedly, we've had some problems like, for example, in the education sector, because we have so little data on how this virus affects children. We have so little um, infrastructure and how to recoup from this virus for the for the education sector. So admittedly for that one, we tried to come up with a policy brief on ha on a um, continuity plan for education, but that one seems to have fallen flat. Um, so that's one example. So I, I, what I'm hearing is the, the strength of the recommendation is triggered by the strength of the data. Essentially, yes, we try to be as data driven as possible. Um, that, that's why we have an entire information team. I would like to thank Poonam, um, Tree, and all the others from the information team who volunteered for that. So because as much as we want to base it on experience, mm -hmm. uh, like I said, it turns out that there's so much information that we don't know. Right. And having um, objective data really helps guide our solutions. Just like what um, Jomar mentioned earlier, the absence of concrete data from this informal sector, particularly in the creative arts industry, is going to be difficult to map out concrete solutions moving forward. Fantastic job, guys. This Let's try to move on from the more difficult questions to a lighter one. What was the best part of being part of the situation room? Or, okay, well, maybe not the best part. What was the, the, the most fun part of being part of the situation room? Korean barbecue. <laughs> oh, okay. Korean barbecue. Uh, we're in a case room named after Meralco and uh, you know, <laughs> paying for the electricity. Sana all Korean barbecue, no? Like, and the no, Korean barbecue. The part, part, part of the protocol is sending everybody, the, every member of the team, Korean barbecue, wherever Where's they are. Where's my Korean barbecue, world. guys? <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, yeah, the donation of food to us by, uh, by, uh, other restaurant groups. Uh, oh, by the way, Earth Origins. Thank you. Yeah, you know. So we want to thank Earth Origins. We wanted to thank Contis for yes. for uh, sending us uh, one of their uh, awesome, delicious mango cake. A uh, mango. Uh, what do you call that? Uh, man, I've only had it twice, but man, the mango bravo. The, the mango bravo. Mango bravo. Wow. They sent us dinner. Um, you know, and uh, also. Um, like Prof Ken sending us coffee, and then uh, among others, uh, some of the NBM students like Harold uh, with his uh, cup with his the company partners that they've had with like Bukit Fresh Agro Digital, yeah. PH uh, sending us fresh vegetables, especially for a lot of our yeah. uh, Situation Room members that are not uh, that are that are Muslim that were uh, uh, practicing their faith and they couldn't eat the food that That's was That's heartwarming here. to know that people were also. Um, trying to contribute, not directly in the execution of the situation room, but at least to keep you guys uh, properly fed, happy. Yeah, I mean, uh, although we're not it's it's unfair the because the people who are in the situation room are not given here. food. <laughs> so Poonam and Nikki and uh, maybe Carlo and Jomar might be complaining that they did not get their, get their share of the ration. <laughs> Jomar is in the guys. dorm. <laughs> I'm in the dorm. Jomar's in the dorm. That's the dorm room right oh, there. Okay. Recognize okay. it. <laughs> so, so I, what other stuff? Okay. Yeah, I do complain. Jason knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it's unfortunate enough that some of the members that are offsite, like Punam and Nikki, you know, uh, and uh, who else is offsite? Like Harold Irwin. Um, you know, they couldn't. Some of uh, the NBM guys who are yeah. contributing also. Right? Who are contributing, yeah. yeah. They're yes. off site, you know, they're not, uh, they couldn't uh, enjoy some of the perks that we were getting. Although having fresh coffee uh, almost every day was a good one. So uh, just those little things to uh, talk about. And then, of course, uh, having very fast internet. Yeah. Very fast <laughs> internet because we need yeah. uh, you know a lot of the Zoom meetings with uh, with you know with different stakeholders and the fact that AIM uh, issued uh, the students uh, you know um, paid subscription for Zoom we were able to sometimes host some of these meetings with other government agencies that did not have uh, Zoom subscriptions. So, Wait, Jason. Except for Nikki, everybody else is still. Studying. 
Yes. Right? Well, yes. Was there any difficulty managing the time that you spent for the uh, sit room and the online classes? How was that like? Uh, I'll say it in one sentence for me. Uh, I, I finally know the meaning of 24 hours and actually <laughs> hoping that there is actually more than 24 hours in a day. Uh, it taught me time management and really maximizing the time that I have. Um, there were times here that we were here very late at night trying to come up with solutions. So I'd say it really taught me a better way to come up with initiatives for myself in terms of time management, juggling work, academic uh, requirements, and the situation room requirements. Uh, how about you, Jeff? Yeah, me, I'm, I'm also working. So my priority is actually my work. So I spend time uh, doing my, uh, my, my uh, tasks as a country security manager. So I just uh, come here at the situation room and do some quick, quick stuff. And of course, I'm also studying. So it's really very challenging. I have to balance my time. But like what I said, I re just recently, um, especially that uh, we are returning to office now. So I, I've been spending much of my time to, to my work. Uh, so it's really challenging. Okay, we're down to a couple of minutes. I have one last question, and I'd like everybody to answer this, uh, but, but try to keep your answer short. Coming from the experience from the Situation Room, and you become the President of the Republic, what would be the first thing you'd do? Uh, it can't be me. I'm a, I'm a foreign student. So. <laughs> well, 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 let's assume. Let's, let's, let's uh, um, come up with hypotheticals here, Jason. So if after the Situation Room experience, uh, the law uh, is changed and you are you you won the presidency so coming from your experience what would be the first thing you change about the country or the um, first thing you do oh I, I apply the basics of leadership that we learn here you know uh, have uh, have a mindfulness infrastructure mindfulness structure when you come to decision making and ensure that the people that you put into places are actually uh, subject matter experts of their particular domain. Mindfulness structure. Okay. Jeff? Yeah, I think I would go to the social capital that we have now. I think we have a very, very rich uh, issue there. So I don't know how to approach it yet, but I think with what we are learning now in our development studies, I, I, I'm actually, uh, maybe part of my, uh, actually part of my MRR would be focusing on the human capital in corporation level. So, but then maybe I could scale it up a big, uh, uh, I could scale it up uh, on a bigger level in case I would become president. <laughs> okay, so um, social human capital. Nikki. The question stressed me out. Not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. You didn't mean to do that. <laughs> That's okay because like I, I really do not envy the office of the president right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> This is not something that, you know, people expected. Um, what would I do as president? Honestly, the, he, I mean, to be fair, he did some things, right? So I'm going to keep those things, like, for example, having a team specific to making sure that all of the different departments are trying to come up with a solution together. Um, the interagency task force, the IATF. Um, but you know, there's also a lot of things that I, I wish I didn't have to deal with as um, a politician. This is going to be ironic, but as a politician, I wish I didn't have to deal with the politics, right? <laughs> um, but, but if you're just given see. one, you, if you, if you were, the question is, if it's just a one thing you would do immediately, what would that be? One thing that I would do immediately is... Oh, man. Coming from That's your difficult. learning from the situation room. The first thing that I would really do is make sure that my, maybe I'm biased because I, I come from a, a data background. I really need to make sure that my data pipeline is secured. Okay. I need to make sure that the information that's coming to me makes sense, are objective, and I can actually make decisions based on them. Okay, data pipeline. Uh, Poonam. Um. I would uh, try to set up a grievance portal. 
Um, this was an initiative in India as well when our PM changed and he really set up a grievance portal. All of the um, government offices got aligned because anybody has now the power to complain or to, to, to log their grievances. And there is a team sitting in the PM office looking at your grievances and helping you out. And that's that's how everything got aligned and, and everybody started working on uh, every single issue that comes up. So that that helps. I think that would help the help here as well. The yeah. Grievance portal. Uh, Jomar. For me, I would just like to make sure that all departments in different uh, government departments talk to each other. For me, that's the um, I'm where I'm most okay. frustrated at. Okay, okay. So departments talking to one another. Uh, Carlo? Yes, I think uh, Jomar and Jason I mentioned it earlier that I'll uh, try to put the right people to the right position uh, who can coordinate and communicate well and um, uh, not just deciding urgently, but you know, uh, taking into consideration all aspects. So uh, I think uh, what I'll add is that um, in putting the right people, I will choose people who think of the next generation. You know, this will be... Uh, we will experience this, but uh, I think it would be good if the people who are leading, who are with us during this pandemic, are also thinking about the next generation. So I think that's my qualification. Okay. So my situation report for the very interesting discussion that we've just had with the brilliant minds behind the AIL situation room is a policy that would put in mindfulness structures that somehow helps develop social uh, capital and human capital in the Philippines that's driven by a very robust data pipeline, which also allows a grievance portal for people to share their sentiments that also triggers people across departments to talk to one another um, and eventually get people uh, joining the coalition who are mindful of the next generation. That's my yeah. attempt at uh, <laughs> that sounds the about right. Yeah, <laughs> the situation Jump, room guys. process. Yay! Okay. <laughs> um, before we let you go, can we just get a quick uh, tour of the situation room, guys? Sir Jeff, Sir Jason. Sure. Yes, what are uh, we looking at here? If you guys look at the AIM situation room uh, user, it says AIM situation room. Uh, you can see his video, and I'll show it to you guys right now. So basically. Uh, when you guys come in here, the first, this is the first thing you see. Right. This is the Miracle case room, no, Jason? Yeah, yeah, Miracle. Yeah. Can you see the video? Okay. You want to see multiple screens. Uh, from here on out, this is where I normally work. We'd like to think. Uh, a site in avoid this school of innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship uh, that was also donated by RCBC for letting us use this monitors for the MSDS and the kind of program and the mentoring program to do the presentations. And uh, I'm pretty sure avoid this and RCBC will be very happy on what we have done with their monitors. Uh, from here on out, we have eight mon 10 monitors that are currently being used. We have six on the ground. Uh, this look at the COVID-19 worldwide. There was a sentimental analysis here, but we can back on for another hour. And then we're also looking at this. Hello. Hello. Uh yeah, so there, there, better. sorry about that. So as soon as you came come in, you guys yes. see the Morocco case room, and this is what yes. you see. And like I said, I just wanted to thank the ASITE or the Aboitis School of Innovation, Technology, and Entrepreneurship for letting us use the monitors that uh, RCBC has donated. Uh, now they can see that we're also using it for a good use and good uh, purpose. And uh, we are also monitoring John Hopkins news, okay. the COVID tracker. And because we are 
in the Philippines, the pandemic is not the only problem we have. We right. also have the problem with the different disasters. And we have Windy here. And then we have UP's uh, version of their income tracker. So, Boy, uh, Jason, you're really capitalizing on the Miralco case room with all of the gadgets turned on. Yeah, so basically this is the <laughs> AIM situation room. And uh, this is the bird's eye view of what you guys are seeing. So when we're sitting out here in the desk. Okay. So we're looking at the screens right now. It doesn't seem like a zen place to be in. Yeah, so this is... Uh, where all the good stuff are happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So thank you guys. And okay. like I said, thank so, you to ASIC for the monitors. Right. Um, and there are a lot of people that went into this uh, particular initiative, not just the people that we have just uh, heard from, but the faculty, people, the faculty that contributed their time and energy to share their insights and their guidance. Also the people that helped uh, bring food to nourish the minds and the body of the people that we just talked to. So I'd like to hear maybe one last message from anybody from the group who'd like to say uh, maybe the closing part about our conversation on the Situation Room. Oh, that won't be me, but I just forgot to mention we would like to thank uh, Prof Ken Hardigan Go, who is the head, the school head of ZSDM, the Stevens Wheeling uh, Developmental School of Management. Uh, for both MDM and EMDRCF for allowing us to have this opportunity. And to Sir Paul, who is the school manager, uh, for looking into a lot of our uh, situation report and guiding us on how to properly write one. To, uh, to excuse me, uh, to Prof. Erica for uh, talking to us into developing a website. And also, uh, we'd like also to thank uh, Prof. Erica, of course, because of the a site monitors that we're using now. And we'd also like to thank uh, you know, uh, Prof. Richard Cruz, uh, Dean GK for actually approving this initiative and making it work for us. And uh, we'd also like to thank, uh, you know, the team from uh, ZSDM uh, recruiting uh, team for giving us this uh, opportunity for, uh, for letting us uh, talk about what we do at the Situation Room and some of the other uh, professors that uh, that we'd like to thank, like Prof Santa Maria, we'd like also to thank him for uh, for letting us uh, have the MBA students despite of their busy schedule. So, okay, oh, by so... the way, the, the, the team contributors too, right? The, the other students that we, we actually have the contributors team as well. So they, they feed us with the information from outside since they are they are out there. So we'd like to thank them also. They are actually part of the situation room. Right. They are, they're composed of students from different programs like MDM, MSDS, MBA, EMDRCM, all, all I think most most uh, programs are represented there. Yeah, we also have one from ME and one of them is uh, N2 and also one from Massive Entrepreneurship who graduated in 2018. Okay, well, there are a lot of people that really put their heart and uh, soul into this initiative, but you guys are inspirational, uh, at least to me. Um, knowing the contribution that you uh, shared and the sacrifices from taking the time from your work, your personal lives, your respective families, and dedicating it to this initiative that is unpaid, and totally out of the generosity of you guys willing to help make a difference in the lives of the uh, Filipinos struggling with this pandemic. Okay, so thank you guys. And we hope that you continue to inspire and contribute more so that we can really harness the power of the collective, the collaboration, not just from the AAM community, but um, for, from all of the stakeholders that you will touch and inspire as you move into your careers. Okay, just a couple of reminders for those of us who, those who are listening. We have an exclusive masterclass series for those who are in, interested to be part of the next cohort of the EMDRCM program, Expectations of a Crisis Leader. That's going to be on June 2, and it will be led by Professor Leslie Cordero from the World Bank. And we will also have the, um, this is a masterclass from the MDM, 
uh, May 27. It's about the new normal inclusive recovery for social impact. You can get more details about those in the uh, AIM EMDRCM page. So, marami pong salamat. Thank you very much, guys. And stay safe. Keep the passion burning. Uh, we can really benefit from all of us working together. Thank you very much. Lead, inspire, transform, guys. Lead, inspire, transform. Thank you.